So check us out. Uh, Passwit is on YouTube. Every session we have done in 2016 and every one that we will do in 2017 is up on our YouTube channel. Sometimes it's easier to just um, search for Passwit and find us and subscribe to the channel. Um, so if, if there's anything that you miss in today's session, you'll see it uploaded and I'll try to get that processed and done later today. Um, obviously our homepage, wit.sqlpass.org, um, is available. It has a list of uh, some of our upcoming webinars. If you're not a member of the WIT virtual group, um, I have to ask why not. You don't have to be a woman to be um, part of the group. But, um, and, and considering that we do as many pure technical sessions as we do uh, women topics, uh, we have a lot to offer. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at pass under our wit or um, follow and use the pass wit hashtag. If there's anything that you want to bring to our attention or to share with other people, that's a great way to do it. Um, and let us know if you want to signal boost something that, that you're doing or sharing. We'd love to have that as well. Uh, January, our theme has been New Year, New Speakers. Lisa Huntley gave a session last week that is up on our YouTube page from Joins to Coins. Why learning the business is important today. Um, you're here to see Kate Grass. Let's get meta ETL frameworks using Bimmel. Um, and uh, on, at the end of the month, uh, so in a few days, uh, Introduction to Oracle SQL and PL SQL um, is another session. And in March, uh, celebrating uh, International Women's Month, we'll have um, Aaron uh, Stellato, Wendy Pastrick, myself presenting something. And um, I think Kaylin Delaney, we just added her to the schedule. So Kaylin will be uh, presenting something as well. Uh, today's session, Let's Get Meta, ETL Frameworks in Bimmel with Kate Grass. Um, obviously, you guys read the description, and hopefully that's why you're here. Um, I'm excited. Kate's a new speaker. Um, she hasn't been doing this very long. Um, and I'd love to say that I encourage her to do this. But I think uh, harassed her is probably a better way to say that. Um, upcoming webinars, of course, January 31st, Introduction to Oracle SQL and PL SQL. February 7th, uh, in conjunction with, I think it's the DBA Fundamentals Group, Aaron is presenting, answering the question, what happened? Uh, using Query Store and Kimberly Tripp were co-promoting stored procedures um, optimization techniques. So that is all I have for you today. Kate, if you're ready, I will turn the broadcast over to you. Just let me know. Um, and before I do this, Kate has built in some pauses for questions. Feel free to ask questions as we go. And um, I'll be happy to um, get Kate to answer those for you. And um, should, should it be a question that I don't understand, I may reply and ask if you want me to make your mic hot um, so that you can ask it yourself. Um, but that would be if, if there's something about it that I don't understand. So I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Kate and let her get started. Alrighty. this guy. All right. And are you viewing a PowerPoint screen with a blank slide? I am. This looks like a, a great presentation. It's totally blank. Isn't it, though? <laughs> All right. So um, bear with me. I'll just get started into uh, presentation mode here. All right, and audio is okay? Absolutely. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, great. <laughs> All right. All right, well, um, first off, I want to like thank Ree for the introduction. Uh, she did harass me, by the way. Um, she mentioned that. Uh, and definitely want to thank both Kathy and Ree for their work with uh, PassWit. I've had the pleasure of meeting both of them and attending their presentations, and definitely want to uh, say if you if you get the opportunity to see one of their presentations, I, I highly recommend it. 
So, as you know, uh, this session is part of the New Year New Speakers series, and I'm honored to be a part of this, uh, even if it did come with some harassment. Uh, and I want to thank everybody that decided to uh, give me an hour of their time and join in today. Um, I hope you're able to get some value out of the content that we're going to cover, and when we're done, I definitely welcome any feedback that you've got. So. A little bit of background about myself. Uh, again, my name is Kate Grass, and I am currently living in Clearwater, Florida, though that's going to change by this weekend. Um, for the last two and a half years, my husband and I have been traveling around the U.S. in an RV with our two dogs. So um, we're not independently wealthy, but we are location independent. We both work remotely, and uh, self-proclaimed dog dork, you know the type, I'm the one that comes up to you on the street and meets your dog before I say a word to you. Um, I'm a hiker, I'm a biker, trying to convince myself that I'm a runner. We'll see how that goes when I attempt my first marathon in New Orleans in a couple weeks. Um, before hitting the road, I lived and worked in Arizona for about 17 years. I spent over a decade working as a SQL developer with an aerospace manufacturing company. And back in uh, about 2014, I kind of reached a standstill in my position, and there were some management changes going on in the company that just kind of left me ready to jump ship. Then we found out that uh, our dog at the time was fighting cancer, and I just decided I didn't want to be sitting in a cubicle when he was at home by himself. So being the dog dork that I am, I put in my notice and quit my job. We sold everything we owned and moved into a travel trailer and started traveling the country with our dog. Uh, and haven't looked back since. So, like I said, uh, I've been working with SQL Server for over 15 years. Um, did a lot with reporting services and uh, just SQL development of various types. Um, since we've been on the road and for a couple of years prior to that, um, I have been doing SSRS and SSIS consulting work. And just recently, I have started working with a company called Exemplar Analytics. They provide data analytics services to health and human service agencies for the most part. It's a really great company. I'm thrilled to be working with them. Um, I actually majored in sociology way back when and had intentions of becoming a social worker. So um, this position that I'm in now kind of brings those two worlds together, um, which is really cool, being able to have the, the SQL side of things with my tech skills that I've developed over the last 15 years and that interest in, in social work and social service from way back when. So that's kind of the who, what, and where for me. So let's go ahead and dive into the good stuff. So we're going to talk today about three things, frameworks, metadata, and BIML. Each one of these can really stand alone with its own merits. And when you combine any two of them, they can play together and do great things. But when you put all three together, it really becomes this super powerful trifecta of technology, greater than the sum of its parts. So we're going to talk about each one of these three elements. But before we do, I want to tell you a little bit about the need for a solution like this. So once upon a time, I was hired by a company called Samantha Solar Systems, S-Cubed. And they were an integrator for all things solar. They sold solar panels, charge controllers, inverters, you name it. Everything you need to power your RV from the sun. So when I first started at SAMS, I was asked to dig into their current ETL systems and come up with a proposed improvement strategy. They'd kind of been running in this maintenance sort of build and deliver mode for a while. And it was time that they dedicated somebody and dedicated the resources to really look at all the moving parts and take that step back and figure out how to ensure that those moving parts kept moving and kept moving efficiently as, as the company continued to grow. So my first task was to figure out how things worked, what different systems were in place, what was working, what wasn't working. Now, luckily, everything was pretty much working as is for the most part. There were some intermittent failures here and there, but nothing that a job restart wouldn't fix. 
So that meant I had a little bit of time, which was a luxury I wasn't used to. Um, I had time to do things the right way rather than just kind of slapping a Band-Aid on something that was broken. So like most small organizations, there was definitely a fair amount of tribal knowledge. Um, there wasn't a lot of ETL documentation on what was really going on in their different systems. And most of the ETL work had been done by one woman, so the majority of the documentation was kind of stuck in her head. Because really, why write support docs if you're the one supporting it? Um, I, I know that I've been there and done that. Pretty sure we all have. Uh, so without a lot of documentation to learn from, I just dug in and started opening up their ETL projects. And they kind of had, um, since they were an integrator, they had different ETL projects for each different supplier. Um, they would get inventory updates and things like this. Uh, from the various suppliers. So they had, for the most part, one project per supplier. So I started opening these up. The first one I opened up, there were over 100 packages. And I dug around and finally found um, kind of the parent package and saw just this huge screen of 100 execute package tasks in integration services all of these child packages. But as messy as that parent package was, the ETL patterns, the actual guts of the processing, those were pretty solid. Their incremental loading, their merges, all of that, that all looked pretty good. I opened up another project and I found the same thing, only different. It was the same guts, but a slightly different flow, some slightly different names, slightly different everything really. I opened up another project and found more of those same differences. Across all of these projects there just weren't any real consistent designs that were used. And even within the same projects there weren't, um, there wasn't really an adherence to the standards as far as naming conventions and things like that. What I didn't find was a whole lot in the way of logging or auditing or error handling. So my initial investigation came down to the good. They definitely had the solid ETL patterns. The bad, this lack of logging, auditing, and error handling, and what I called the ugly, the inconsistent design, and the lack of any real um, code and naming standards. So let's talk a little bit about some of those problems and what they actually mean. Lack of standardization. Sometimes you have different developers that implement different designs. Sometimes you have different projects worked on by the same developer, and that results in different designs. And sometimes you have the same project with the same developer just on a different day, and you end up with different designs. So what's wrong with that? We're told diversity is good, right? Well, sure. Change and diversity are great when you're talking about brainstorming or your workforce. New ideas, thinking outside the box, these are all great things when you're in front of a whiteboard. But when you're talking about production systems, standardization is really key. Without standards and consistency, you will lose time. New developers are going to hit a much sharper learning curve. We're talking hairpin kind of curve. If they have to start from scratch every single project. Even your experienced developers are going to be slower to make changes if each change that they make has to be implemented in a slightly different manner for each project. I don't know about you guys, but I can't tell you how many times I open up some code or a SQL script that I wrote a couple years, months, heck, sometimes only weeks or days ago. And before I can do anything, I have to re-educate myself on how the code works, what it actually does. And that's with my own code. So it's not just about time. You're going to lose accuracy. If you have to do a basic task 10 times, but it's a little different each time you do it, you're more likely to make a mistake. And because the work is not streamlined, you have to repeat that task 10 times, making these slight adjustments along the way, you're pretty much paying your developers to 
spend time doing monotonous copy-pasting rather than solving real problems. The next problem I identified was very limited logging. Really, the only logging that was being done was the creation of the output file that's generated by the SQL agent job step. Now, there's other ways to get more out of this feature, but in this case, the most basic settings were being used. So very little data was getting logged, and it, it was being overwritten each time. It wasn't persisted. So you can see an example here. Really, the only information you were getting out of it was this start and stop timestamp. That was pretty much it. So what happens when you don't have a whole lot of logging going on? Well, remember when I said that that parent package had over 100 execute package tasks that called all the child packages? Well, when there's a failure in one of those and you're relying on that SQL agent log, you're not really getting a lot of information to go off of, and it becomes really difficult to investigate what actually went wrong and where, kind of like looking for a needle in a haystack. Uh, pinpointing issues in performance also becomes really difficult. So you might see this huge increase in your job processing time. Well, without any logging, it's hard to find out which package was the culprit for that. Or maybe you don't even notice the increase in the job time, but one package all of a sudden is taking 10 times, to 10 times as long to run as it did before. Without logging, you never know. The next problem I encountered was no auditing. So what's the difference between logging and auditing? Well, some people lump them together, and that's fine, but I, I think it makes sense to at least talk about them separately. Both are really variations on the same process, just recording events. The difference is what events you're recording. So to paraphrase an explanation that I found on Stack Exchange, logging is recording of events that describe what the software is doing. Auditing is recording events that describe outcomes, changes to your data. So things like the number of customers that you inserted or the number of updates, uh, number of orders that you deleted. So why is auditing important? Well, without auditing, you can't really implement any sort of proactive alerts when things get wonky. So if your source data and your target data are supposed to match after you're done with a successful ETL operation, it really makes sense to check those row counts and fire off an alert when they get out of sync. It also becomes really difficult to provide any sort of historical explanation without auditing. So let's say that your, your boss comes to you and says, I think there's something going on with our inventory report. We're showing half of what we should be. So you look at the current data and sure enough, there's 5,000 products when there should be 10,000. So you ask your boss, hey, when did you notice this change? And she says, well, I was in Costa Rica for a week, so I haven't looked at the report, so I have no idea when it happened. I just noticed it this morning. Well, without auditing, you have no idea when that drop in product counts actually happened. So it just becomes really hard to explain changes in history. And it's also hard to, exchange, to explain changes in processing time that are found in your logs. Oh, but wait, you don't have logs, so never mind about that one. So maybe instead of asking about product counts, the manager comes to you and asks why your reports are late. She used to get them at 9, and now she's getting them at 11. So you check your SQL agent history, because you don't have a log, and you see that your ETL job did in fact take three hours instead of one hour. Well, without any audit data, you don't know if that's because there was three times as much data or if it's because the internets were three times as slow. So just like logging, not having that recorded history makes investigation and explanation a royal pain. Now the next problem I'm sure you're familiar with, no error handling. Uh, just like the output file that we saw a few slides ago, the only error logging that I found at SAMS was done by the SQL agent job step, and it had the same types of problems. 
information was really limited, and it didn't have that necessary context. You might see an error regarding a conversion failure, and the log file would tell you that it was a conversion failure on column ID. Well, you've got over 100 tables. Every single one of them has a column named ID. It's not really very helpful. So the logging was definitely lacking. And then on the other side of things, how the errors were actually being handled was also lacking. So what happens when there's a failure? In this scenario, the only handling of the errors was the automatic retry attempts of the SQL, SQL agent job steps. So since the job step called the parent package, there wasn't any restartability in the application. So what does that mean for production? Well, as we talked about, the SQL agent error logs, not very helpful. So that means you're going to have a lot of wasted time troubleshooting your errors. And speaking of wasted time, if you're not handling those errors programmatically, somebody has to manually intervene and handle them. And the lack of restartability was really one of the biggest problems. The design of the system meant that if any child package failed, the whole ETL process had to start over. So if you've got a process that takes three hours and something fails at the very end, you've just wasted those three hours of processing time. You also didn't have any error history. So it's hard to identify patterns when you don't have a history to go off of. Um, if you're experiencing connection issues with one of your vendors and it, you're dropping a database connection during your ETL process, and this is happening um, you know, every Monday through Friday, but maybe not on weekends. If you don't have proper error handling that's recording this historically, you can't see those patterns, and it's really hard to fix things if you can't see them. So quick recap, main problems that I identified when I started digging into the ETL systems at SAM Solar Systems was a lack of standardization and very little logging, auditing, and error handling. So enough about problems. Let's talk about solutions. The solution I proposed looked pretty much like this. An ETL framework driven by metadata and powered by BIML. Now, I didn't invent any of these things. I'm certainly not the first person to put them together. But when it came time for me to implement this stuff, I did find that there was kind of a lack of this high-level overview of how these three pieces coexisted, how they worked together. And I kind of figured that I probably wasn't the only one dealing with this scenario, so it seemed like something worth sharing. My hope today isn't that you walk away from this webinar with a line-by-line -line instruction on how to create a framework. But I do hope that it gets the wheels turning for you and you take some of the ideas we talk about and build on them, create your own, and craft a solution that really works best for you because it is going to be a unique solution. A uh, quick note that there are some commercial and open source solutions out there, uh, some really great ones and some others that are maybe not so great. Uh, so definitely look at that and decide if that's right for you. Uh, for, for us at, at SAMS, it, it ended up not being the, the right fit to, to build, or I'm sorry, to buy something. Um, we had found that with the implementation of the Integration Services Catalog in SSIS 2012, there was a really good foundation for a lot of these frameworky type things. So between that and then just not finding um, the perfect fit for us, you know, some of them, some of these solutions out there were just too small or too simple and others were way over the top more than what we needed. So the final decision was made to use the available features uh, from the catalog and within integration services and build our own framework. So let's go ahead and dig in and start talking about these three components. So as far as frameworks go, we're going to talk about what is a framework, different characteristics of a framework, 
the benefits that we get out of implementing a framework, some of the functional components, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the design process that I've used. So when you think about a framework, you can think about a group of design patterns, common reusable tools and processes that facilitate the larger process, in this case, an ETL process. Whereas a set of instructions tells you how to do something, it details each step and gives you important values that you need. A framework takes that set of instructions and gives you templates to do those things. Instead of just line-by-line -line instructions, you've got these templates that streamline the process, provide efficiency, and give you consistency. So there's a couple key principles that go into this. One is the DRY principle, that don't repeat yourself. Another is the rule of threes, which basically says that you can copy code once, but as soon as you're ready to copy it a second time, you should refactor it and eliminate the duplication. Now, those aren't new concepts. They're applied throughout the software world all over the place. But we're applying them specifically to ETL here, not just to code. So you ask yourself, how many times do you copy and paste that same SSIS package before you think about refactoring things? So the characteristics of a framework, it, it helped me as I was going through and trying to decide um, you know, how the solution was actually gonna, gonna look. So keep looking back at these characteristics. And the first one was keeping it as simple as possible. You don't wanna over-architect things. There's just not a need to. And inherent in the framework is that you standardize things. Now, the flip side of standardization is flexibility. Sure, you could standardize things a great deal by saying that every import in your ETL system is going to merge 10 and only 10 days of historical data. But that's not very flexible, so you have to find that sweet spot. Generally, you do this by parameterizing things, which brings us to the next characteristic, metadata-driven. We're gonna go into detail on this one in the next section, so let's go ahead and talk about the benefits of a framework. When you implement a framework based on those characteristics, you abstract the complexity, and that really opens the doors for broader support. Your system becomes transparent, and it allows people to better understand what's going on and, and how things are working. So when you wanna go backpack Italy for two weeks, the rest of your team has a much better chance of being able to understand what's going on and, and can help support things while you're gone. When you standardize your design and your code, your documentation becomes easier, your training becomes easier, and it takes less time to implement new systems and to make changes to your existing systems. So along with all this, you get much fewer mistakes. When you're able to make a change in one place rather than 100 places, it's a lot easier to do it accurately. So we talked a lot about concepts. How does this translate into actual functional components? Well, it depends. I heard it was required to have at least one it depends answer in every presentation, so there it is. But really, the framework's designed for one organization. It's gonna be completely different than a framework designed for another organization. Yes, there are some things that are gonna be present regardless of the type of work that you're doing or you know, what you're producing, but there's a lot that's gonna be driven by what you're doing and what problems you're trying to solve. Are you trying to build an Oreo or are you trying to build an iPad? The, the complexity of your framework is going to be impacted by the complexity of your systems. So let's take a look at some of the potential pieces of the puzzle. When you're trying to figure out what functional components you're going to include in your framework, one of the first things to do is look at your existing projects and see what elements are repeated across those projects. Maybe you already have some logging that 
is, has been copy pasted into each of your projects. Now ask yourself what elements should be repeated across your projects. Maybe one of your developers added a great error handler to her project. Well, it would be really slick to just add that in to every project that you've got. So you want to look at those things that are either already in existence or should be and repeat it across the projects. So the list that we've got here is by no means exhaustive. They're just some of the possibilities. And each of them could honestly have its own webinar. So we'll just kind of touch on each one real quick. The orchestration and parallelism, think of this as the traffic cop for your ETL. It tells who to go, where, and when. Do you have one package that has to go before all the others? Do you have packages that can go at the same time? Or do they need to be executed sequentially? Logging and auditing. We've talked about these, the different types of events that we can record. Reporting, monitoring, notifications. Once you've got events captured, then you can start thinking about what to do with that data. Your performance reports can show ETL processing changes over time. You can have dynamic notifications that tell you when certain things exceed different thresholds that you've set. Fault tolerance and recoverability. What happens when a package fails midway? Can it be restarted? Can the project be restarted? This might not be wrapped into a standalone package, but it might be something that's baked into the design of your ETL patterns. Templates. At a really basic level, just templating out your different design patterns and being able to apply those across projects. Deployment. You're going to want to define processes for deployment to your various environments. Um, now, you can automate procedures, but at the very least, you want to define the process. Really, there's countless other elements that could be included. You can always create more functionality. And you can always have a more involved, more encompassing solution. My husband always says you have to decide if you want to go to the moon or if you want a ham sandwich. Determining that scope is up to you. So how do you make those choices? Well, when you're trying to determine what to incorporate into your framework, there's going to be a lot of brainstorming going on. I find it's helpful to kind of walk through this process first thing you want to do is identify your pain points. What is actively causing problems in your current system? Are you getting repeated failures? Are you experiencing performance problems? Are you getting frequent requests for changes from clients or vendors that are causing you to make all these changes in your ETL system? Then list out your wants. This is the meat of the moon part of the process. If you had a team of dedicated developers and you had all the time in the world, what would you want to include in your solution? Then go back and highlight your needs. So you might have uh, incoming regulations that, that require you to archive data for a particular amount of time based on the type of data. Or you might have a new service level agreement coming into play that's going to require your ETL to run in X amount of time. So you start there and you look at increasing the speed of your processing and maybe setting alerts uh, when you get close to those limits. So go through and just highlight the things that you absolutely have to have, your needs. Now go back to your list and take a look at what's actually feasible. Your trip to the moon might not be feasible. So determine which items are actually going to happen based on your resources. Don't cross off any that aren't feasible, but move them over to a separate list. Then take the rest of the list and go through and rank things based on value and complexity. So maybe, you know, whatever works best for you, but a score of one to five. Uh, and, and then you can start to look at, okay, what's got the highest value and the least complexity? Those are the things, you know, your low-hanging fruit. Um, those are the ones that you definitely want to include. And you keep going based on your resources and, and what that value complexity ratio is. But definitely try and decide on a finite set of components that you're going, that you're going to incorporate 
and then table the rest for phase two. So now that you've got this list together, it's time to figure out how the pieces work together. And this is where I'd like to say that pencil and paper should be your best friend and lots and lots of eraser. Uh, if you have a whiteboard, that can be helpful too, and moving around post-it notes on a whiteboard. Uh, there's going to be a lot of um, scratching things out and moving things around in, in this phase of the, the mapping project to see you know, what the order of operations is and how these different components are going to work together. So in my solution, the framework project ended up being three different, pra three different packages. The first was an initialization package, and that's what we're looking at right here. The second was an orchestration controller package, and then a thread controller. So in this one, you can see some logging going on, there's some error handling, and then that task with the green lightning bolt down uh, in the middle, bottom middle, that executes the second package. Second package, this is that traffic controller, uh, the orchestration package. And each one of these, execute thread roots, those execute an instance of the third package. The third package is this thread root. Don't worry too much about all the innards of this one, we'll see it again later. Um, but I just wanted to show you, and in the middle here, you'll see that, again with that green lightning bolt, you'll see that uh, exec child package, and that's where it's actually ca calling your true DTS uh, or, I'm sorry, your true data flow package. So now that we've talked about the whole concept of a framework, let's get meta, shall we? Like I said at the beginning, the three elements here can all stand alone. And so far, everything that we talked about in regards to the framework, you can develop all of those elements without using metadata. But let's take a look at what happens when we add metadata to that picture. We'll talk about what metadata really is, how to abstract your metadata, and how to utilize that metadata. So in its simple for, simplest form, there's this equation, meta x equals x about x. Metacognition, thinking about thinking, or the more fun meta joke. A horse, a duck, and a bear walk into a bar. Bartender says, what is this, some kind of a joke? I know, not really funny, but it's a meta joke. So metadata equals data about data. Ralph Kimball describes metadata as all the information that defines and describes the structures, operations, and contents of the system. And he breaks it down into three separate parts, technical, business, and process metadata. Technical metadata defines the objects and processes that comprise the system. So in an ETL system, we're talking about packages and connections. Business metadata describes the data in user terms. What data is available, where it came from, what does it mean, so on and so forth. Process metadata describes the operational results, rows transferred, things like this. So given that definition, some of the data is going to be used to define the system, the technical metadata, the business metadata, and some of the metadata is created by the system, process metadata. And that goes back to the audit component that we talked about. So how do you determine the metadata that your framework is going to consume? Well, think about the properties associated with your existing ETL systems that potentially have different values in different uh, systems. Connection, th connection strings, your uh, maximum amount of threads that you want executed in each system the ETL pattern that's used in each system. Are you doing incremental versus a full refresh? Then you've got all of your database metadata, the, the stuff that you normally think about in terms of metadata, your table names, your column names, your frequency of your ETL process. Are you doing these updates on a daily or a weekly basis? And this list can go on and on. Then you want to think about the definable properties within your systems. So 
these are going to be things that might be implemented already in your projects as um, either parameters or variables. Some examples might be file name patterns or um, directory name patterns, a variable for lag days or cutoff dates to say that you know you only want to import data from the last 10 days or only take data that's been updated since January 1st of 2012. Various arguments for exter executing external tasks. Maybe you're calling a zip program and, and you have command line arguments that you pass in, uh, in, in variables. And again, that list can go on and on. What you're looking at here is a diagram of just a part of the database that was constructed to store the ETL metadata. And you can see quite a bit of the technical metadata that defines the objects that comprise the system. You've got applications, application packages, application package connections, variables, and then there's a little bit of business metadata as well. There's a supplier code within the application. So this is just a, a very simple representation of part of what the metadata database um, could look like. So now that you have your metadata, you have to think about what to do with it. Well, really it can be used to define the objects by setting variables, or it can be used to feed any of those various components of the framework that we talked about. Now, not all metadata is going to be consumed directly by an SSIS package. Some metadata is going to be used by other complementary parts of your framework. Um, you're going to have reports, you're going to have alerts, you're going to have stored procedures. So it's, it's a larger system um, that's not just limited to SSIS packages. And that metadata is going to be used across the system. So you can imagine uh, different types of metadata that would be used for orchestration, um, for logging. You can turn flags on and off and um, set thresholds for notifications, things like this. So at the highest level in the solution is the orchestration. The maestro package, just like a conductor in a symphony, it determines its actions based on the metadata that it has and it sends info and commands to the various child packages. So now that we've looked at the metadata, let's take another look at that package and see how the metadata fits in. So this is that orchestration route. And you'll see at the top, we're executing thread zero. Then we're checking the status in a SQL task. And then that wide band, we've got a sequence container and we have an execute thread one through eight. Below it, we're executing a thread 99. So this orchestration and parallelism, it's one of the main functional components of the framework. And it, this package right here is going to set the stage to call the metadata and feed in to the next package that is the thread root. So, Take a step back here, and each one of these execute thread root is going to kick off an instance of this thread root package. So in the thread root package, we'll, we'll take a, a quick little tour through some of the tasks that are happening here. Uh, that second down from the top, you've got an execute SQL task to get the application packages. Uh, this queries the metadata and gets the list of packages assigned to the application with a thread ID equal to zero. Then for each uh, record that it gets, it's looping through and doing some stuff. First it outputs the application package metadata, then it logs the launching of the child package. So now we're going back to, to some of the, lo the logging functional components. Then you have the execute uh, child package, and that actually launches the data flow package that really does the guts of your ETL processing. 
Now I'll jump over to the screenshot on the right, the child DTSX, and what you see there is a sequence container set package variables, and that sequence container is going to be in every child package that gets called from the framework. So the first task of that is another execute SQL task, get variable metadata. It's executing a stored procedure that just goes to the metadata database and gets the values for the variables that are defined within the child package. And that's totally dynamic. So you can have any number of variables or none at all defined in your child package. And as long as you have the corresponding metadata stored in your metadata database, those variables get set at runtime. If you want to change a variable in your child package, all you do is change the data in the database. You don't have to touch the SQL agent. You don't have to open SQL Server data tools. So now that child package has all its happy variables and it goes on about its business. And when that child package is all done, control comes back over to the thread root over on the left and it checks to see if the child package behaved. If it did, it logs the success. If it did not behave, it logs the failure accordingly. You can also see in uh, on the bottom right of the thread root package, the log error and failure. There's a SQL task there that gets the, um, the first SQL task, get error from catalog. That's where it's making use of some of that information that's in the SSIS DB catalog. And I definitely recommend checking that out if you haven't already. There's a lot of great things in there that you can integrate into your solution. So definitely take advantage of what's already been created for you. So you've seen some of the elements of the framework. You've seen how the metadata can feed into these. And everything we've seen so far, we're using the metadata in a somewhat manual manner, manual manner, kind of like a blueprint. We're getting values and we're setting properties. Uh, these two components, the framework and the metadata, they can provide immense value when you put them together. You can incorporate common tasks, wrap your whole ETL execution up nicely into a neat little package of packages. So you can use the metadata this way where we get the values for runtime executions and you build your packages manually. Each one of those child packages that we didn't really see, we just saw the beginning of it. Or you can BIML it. So this brings us to that third component of the trifecta. So we saw how metadata can feed into the framework. Now we're going to look at the third piece and see how metadata feeds into BIML and how BIML can feed your framework. So with this section, we're not going to go into a lot of detail on, um, on how to write BIML. I'm not going to teach you the BIML language. But I will tell you uh, what BIML is, some, a couple different options for how you can use BIML. We'll take a quick look at some BIML script, some BIML on steroids, or maybe just metadata and tell you where you can learn more. So BIML was created by Veragence, stands for Business Intelligence Markup Language, and it's an XML dialect that's used to define BI assets. Those include relational models, um, cubes, SSI, SSAS objects, and what we're interested in, packages, or SSIS objects. BIML is human readable and human writable. And when you compile BIML, it creates the exact same packages that are created within the SQL Server data tools GUI via drag and drop. So you can kind of think of BIML as uh, BIML is to SSIS packages as HTML is to web pages. So here's a very simple BIML code snippet. This set of code right here, not too many lines, this creates a full SSIS DTSX package. It'll create a package with a connection, a container, and an execute SQL task within that container. So some options for using BIML. You've got BIML Express, which is a free plugin for Visual Studio. You've got BIML Online, 
which is a online uh, IDE. It, it's currently in a beta version and you can get a free account right now. Then Bimmel Studio um, is a subscription-based uh, software, it's formerly known as MIST. These are all available through Veragents.com. And what we're going to look at is the first one, Bimmel Express, which is the free plugin in Visual Studio. So now we're going to flip over and see some actual Bimmel. Give me one second and I'll move this screen over here. All right. And hopefully you guys are seeing my SQL Server data tools. We are. Um, great. Thank you that, for that, Re. Appreciate that confirmation. Okay. So what you're seeing on the screen right now is that same demo file within SQL Server data tools. And I just want to show you that um, there, there's no tricks here. Um, over here on the right, you can see my SSIS packages. The only one I have currently is this GUI package, and that's one that I created manually using the drag and drop. So, um, and just to show you, the Bimmel Express menu is up here. Uh, that's what you get when you install that plugin. And your Bimmel files will come over here um, in your Solution Explorer under the miscellaneous folder. So, you've got that basic uh, Bimmel file right here. If you right click on that, generate SSIS packages. Happened so fast you probably didn't even see it, but it added this Bimmel package up here. Open that up and here we've got our Tupperware container, an execute SQL task, and it looks just like this one that I did by drag and drop. So pretty cool stuff there. Now What's better than Bimmel? Well, Bimmel script is better than Bimmel. Bimmel script allows you to put in code nuggets. So you can define variables, you can put in um, control flow structures, you can call other code. So here's a pretty simple Bimmel script. We've got a couple variables that we're defining up top. We're executing a while loop. We are referencing some variables, and then we're incrementing our variable down here at the end of our loop. So all I'm going to do here is instead of building one package, I'm going to build 10 of them. But I'm not going to copy and paste, which is going to put me at risk for errors. I'm going to do it programmatically. So I'm just looping through, creating 10 packages. Now you'll see here, there's only this Bimmel package and GUI package over here in the right. Right click on Bimmel script, generate SSIS packages, and bam, Bimmel package one through nine. So if we go ahead and just look at Bimmel package three, and I have found that sometimes they do get a little slow to load. So let's. Hey, Kate. Kate, there we go. Kate, can you yep. make that screen a little bit larger? Um, larger, sure. Yeah. Oh, I should shout zoom it, but if you could make it, <laughs> if you could make it a little bit larger. Uh, let's see here. There you go. Awesome. Thanks. Is that better? Okay. All right. So, uh, like I said, over here we just created nine packages with just that much code. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I'm seeing we only have five minutes left. Um, I'll show you real quick the, the final piece um, of using Bimmel script and metadata. So to pull in the metadata, I've got a script here. I'm executing a stored procedure here, get source tables for app. That's going to my database and it's just returning a list, a very simple list right now of tables, table names. So it gets the data back. It's setting a couple variables, one for schema name, one for table name. It's using this call Bimmel script, 
call BIML script directive right here, which is calling another set of code in the ref build package for table BIML file. That file over here is what's actually creating the, the child packages. So we're passing in the schema name, we're passing in the stage name, we're setting a couple variables. In this case, I have a variable that I've defined in my database called top rows, and I can change that in the database. You'll see right here it's set to one, so it's going to create a SQL statement that just says select top one from the table. It's setting that as the source down here as variable input, and then it's just dumping it into a staging table. So some other files that we've got, um, the environment file is just setting connections, and I've got a script package, which is um, got all the code to actually set those variable values, and that's embedded in here. Um, the bulk of it is, is right here, just looping through the variable container and setting values based on what's in the metadata database. So if we select these guys and generate SSIS packages, and you'll see down here at the bottom, it says expanding BIML in the bottom left. And BIML expansion completed. Woohoo. Got through a live demo, hopefully, without an error. Nothing blowing up yet. And just like that, we created address, customer, and product. Those were in my SQL Server database. I returned that list. And the first thing that it's doing is setting package variables here, doing a refresh in here, this copy all from target. I've created a source. There's my select one from the source. Now I've got 10 set as the value in the database. So if we execute this, it should grab that value of 10. And rather than seeing one record in the address table, we should see 10 records. So let's go ahead and give that guy a quick go. And meanwhile, I'm going to pull up the management studio. Well, and right there, we don't even need to pull it up. You can see 10 rows. So even though the original code said to select the top one, it went to the database, it got the value of 10 from the database, and brought in the 10 that I told it to. So there's those 10 records. And just to the application package variable table that we had seen before. Very simple representation of it right here, but there's a value of 10 that it's assigning to this top rows variable. So this shows you the power of bringing in the metadata, being able to create these configurable packages and those packages then get executed from your framework. So between your BIML, your metadata, and your framework, those three components work together and provide just this incredibly powerful uh, ability to create a, a fully functional solution that really increases your efficiency and minimizes your risk for error. So I know it's 1 o'clock now. Um, if there's any questions, I'm happy to stay on and answer any questions. Um, um, so one I was already able to answer. They wanted to know if the slides were going to be available, and I told them that we would be making those available. And the only other, I said, I told them that the slide and the video would both be available. Um, the other question is, uh, popped up when you were talking about error handling. and mm -hmm. Um, are there any specific errors that you think are really important to capture and there are there some or are there some that you think are probably important to ignore? Oh wow, um, I mean that's, 
So it's really going to be dependent on what it is that you're trying to do. Um, Immigration Services is going to tell you what's important and what's not based on whether or not it fails your package. Um, there are some proactive things that you can do uh, that wouldn't be caught from within Immigration Services uh, that the package wouldn't necessarily consider an error, but you might need to check in your, in your database after the fact based on business rules. Um, but as far as things in that package, Immigration Services is going to fail a package um, so obviously those are going to be ones that you, you definitely want to be able to handle. I don't know if, if there's a, a specific kind of functionality that was relevant to that question or not, but... Yeah, they didn't get um, what, specific about that. Um, okay. <laughs> and I apologize, I want to jump back real quick. Um, if you want to learn more about Bimmel, uh, BimmelScript.com is a great place to start. On SQL Server Central, there is a stairway to Bimmel, which is a great set of articles that walks you through a lot of the things that I've touched on in much more detail um, as far as Bimmel goes. There's a bunch of Bimmel blogs out there written by some really amazingly talented people. Um, just go ask Uncle Google for Bimmel blogs and you'll find them. And uh, SQL Saturdays are a great place. Um, these past events that happen for free all over the country. There's a lot of Bimmel stuff going on at these, um, especially if you find one of the BI specific ones. But there's a lot of information, a lot of really, um, really educated people out there that are doing some cool things and, and sharing it. So um, it's, it's out there if you want to find it. And if you haven't gotten anything else out of this webinar today, I give you this. Girl Scout Cookies has a cereal now. <laughs> Before you go, I have one attendee has asked if there's a way to contact you. And that wasn't there is on the email address. Um, yeah, on the if, if you go to Twitter, I'm at Kate Grass at Twitter, um, KateGrass.com. You can find me at Kate at KateGrass.com for an email. Um, I unfortunately am not the best at actually blogging. Um, so my kategrass.com site is uh, pretty slim right now, but you can at least get contact information from there. And please don't hesitate to email with any questions. Um, Sorry, I was muted. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. Um, I think we've answered um, all of the questions. Uh, there's, I have, I've gotten a lot of feedback that said, great job, thank you, very, very interesting. Great job presenting, all that kind of stuff. So thank you very much, Kate. You'd never know you were a, a new speaker. So we, oh, thank you. We really appreciate you doing this for us today. And I promise I will try to have this um, uh, up, the video and the slides and everything up and available by the end of the day. All right.